African government actually recognized this day, uh, and you wonder why. Fatma, let me start with you. So it's the second edition of the African Anti-Corruption Day. Kenya currently at position 143 out of 180 on the Transparency uh, Index rankings. Now, while government bears all the bad press for corruption, we know the private sector cannot be held innocent in this matter. Uh, we saw, we've seen in the recent past collapse of privately owned banks, and we've seen a lot of incidents in privately run companies as well. Let me get your opening statement on corruption, this time with a bias towards the private sector. Where are we in all this? Uh, maybe that's where we can begin. I would first thank you um, for calling us to talk about anti-corruption. Um, the best way I would start saying this is that one finger cannot kill, now English we call it... Um, allows mm -hmm. lies okay. okay so basically it simply means that we are both um, part of it it's not one finger so we cannot just say it's the government or it's the public sector because the minute we start pointing fingers to the public sector four fingers point back at us this is something that we both have we are both um, guilty as far as corruption is concerned and we both need to do something in order to remove corruption in our country mm -hmm. uh, it starts with you as a person but what we have seen is that everybody wants to say you are corrupt the government is corrupt everybody else is corrupt apart from me but at the end of the day we all are in your view how serious is corruption in the private sector I, I don't know if you have any numbers uh, maybe some of the other guests might have but What's actually the numbers are, are, are very very big because when we are talking about business cost of corruption um, in, in corruption increases cost of doing business by over 20 percent and most organizations um, and ISPA could confirm this is that um, organizations make profits between 15 to 20 percent if you're going to lose mm -hmm. over 20 percent actually the figure is 22 percent to corruption what are you actually making Kenya is one of the countries that has a very vibrant uh, middle class. We are very hardworking people, but why don't we see growth? We don't see growth because our growth is hampered by corruption. By corruption. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to you a bit later on to figure out so what are companies doing? Mm -hmm. How are they sort of wiggling through, especially those who want to do it the right way, uh, and, but those also who are taking advantage of the current environment that we are in um, you know, to do deals underhandedly. Um, Fred, let me come to you as well. I can also get your opening statement, and I'm curious to know uh, a little bit about the, you know, the, the command by the president for accountants to step aside. Document officers were also mentioned, and I know ISPAC has had a few thoughts about that, but let me first give you a chance to give us your Thanks. initial thoughts on this topic. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, just to join my colleague panelist, uh, Umawi, to thank you for having us on your studio today to comment on this very topical issue, uh, the fight against corruption. Um, when you Pose the question wh which sector generates corruption in this country. There is the supply side and there is the demand side. Mm -hmm. And then I put the blame, I apportion the blame 50 50. 50 public sector, 50 private sector, because um, corruption is generated out of an exchange um, process. And then government, as and when corruption is perpetrated, it's arising out of an exchange. And we see government doing business with the private sector. So if there is corruption within government, then there is equal measure of corrupt tendencies from the private sector. Uh, and, and holistically, as a people of Kenya, uh, I, I, it would be fair of us to stare at this monster collectively. Um, let's have a national discourse. Where did the rain start beating us and how do we correct ourselves? So when you talk of corruption, the private sector is as guilty as the public sector be because without the private sector government will not do business and it's out of business government businesses that corruption is perpetrated okay thank you. Rachel let me come to you and even as, as you as you you know give us your initial thoughts maybe can you also let us know what do you think Kenya has lost even for example in terms of foreign investment because mm -hmm. of corruption just share your thoughts on the topic but also you could also talk a bit about that question thank you very much Wahiga for having me on this show but also to say that um, to join my colleagues in saying that yes both parties private sector and public sector do have a role to play in one perpetrating uh, corruption but also in looking at how we can end it so we have a role in both of those those of those responsibilities and as the private sector we are both 
we can look at it as both perpetrators but also victims of corruption victims of corruption to the extent that you want to do business you want to do business properly you have a business plan that clearly does not include a line where you have allocated money for bribery but then you find yourself in a situation where that uh, you know your profits are really eaten into by the fact that there's that um, requirement or demand that is being made upon the business and so one of the ways that we have looked at it is to look at it and say what can private sector do to one call out corruption in the public sector but to also look inward and say we as businesses how ready are we how capable are we to speak about this issue of corruption and mm -hmm. what can we do within our own house to clean our own house and also to look at what are the changes that we can make that would make us more resilient as businesses and therefore less of victims to the situation that we find ourselves in and so a lot of work is being done in that but your question about the the types of losses that we've made and you know, I may not have the exact statistics because we know that some of it is the absence of an investment which you cannot necessarily be able mm -hmm. to quantify. Yes. But it's to say that there are many companies that are cognizant that because of their mother countries, because of the rules and regulations that determine how, how they are managed in their countries, it's a risk for them as businesses to come into a country where there's corruption. Mm -hmm. And so if they're determining, should I, should I invest in a new plant, in a new manufacturing plant, in this country or the other, they're going to look at our corruption index. They're going to be able to look at it and say, I don't want to put my company at risk by going into a risky environment. Because I have the SEC and other different types of bodies that determine my, uh, my governance and that would look into what I do there. So that they would be then making a decision based on the corruption in the environment. So we do definitely lose opportunities through that. Uh, Fatma, to what extent has the private sector condoned corruption, encouraged it even? In fact, um, I would, would like to add to what Rachel just said. Um, recently we, we lost an investment, I think it was a cement factory, mm -hmm. um, the gentleman from Nigeria, um, the name has just slipped me. He was Dangote, supposed Dangote. to have started Dangote, uh, Dangote, Dangote? Dangote? Yes. Okay. and then it went to Ethiopia. Why? Because the corruption index in Kenya is way, way too high. And if an African can, refu can, can refuse to invest in another African country <laughs> because of corruption, can you imagine what would happen with other countries whereby they have laws, for example, the FCPA, which is the Foreign, uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or the UK Bribery Act, which, which um, will actually follow them wherever they are. Now, where have we condoned? Corruption comes because you feel that you want to have that competitive advantage over other people. Um, I may not have the skills, but if I know somebody, I will get it. Mm -hmm. And that is where we lose it. And that is where um, we hamper our own development. Kenya is a rich country. Mm -hmm. We have everything. We do. But the one thing that we don't have is that everybody wants to get for themselves. Now, most of us, if you're at my age, most of us went to school and we actually did not even pay uh, that much fees. But now that I am here, I want to keep it all. Mm -hmm. I don't want my children, my grandchildren to have it. And this is how we conduct, condone corruption every single day. So the public sector is there, the private sector is there. But now there is a new corrupt person which we need to be aware of. That is the consumer. That is you and I. Mm -hmm. You go somewhere and you tell um, the employee, you know what? I will give you this much to do this you for do me. This for me. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I actually want to interrupt you. I want you to refer you to the pictures on the screen. What is being tied out? Okay, so, sorry, we're looking at traffic police mm -hmm. being bribed. Mm -hmm. They're not bribed by quote unquote government officials. Mm -hmm. It's you and I. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, carry on even, you know, even as we have that. So it's, 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 it's us. You go somewhere, you want to get a big deal, you want to get a big, better deal. Mm. So you are the person, as a consumer, you actually um, you want to corrupt in order to get something better for you. You drive badly. Okay, I mean, there's a big debate here. But at the end of the day, you want to get things easier and faster for you as opposed to following the law. And you as a person condone. So it starts with the individual, it goes to the company, and then it goes to the bigger one and, and it, it escalates so much that corruption has become a big thing that everybody feels that where do we start? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how, how, how do we cut up this elephant uh, that is so big in the room? And well, you have an interesting initiative and I want to come back to you to talk about mm -hmm. that shortly. But Fred, the role of professional societies mm -hmm. in fighting corruption. Kenyans feel that they've been so quiet 
it's, they have no professional society is not really playing their role in fighting corruption because the people who are arrested and hold to court all belong to one society or the other whether it's ISPAC, whether it's LSK here for Rachel, or amongst <laughs> others. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I think everyone here, just, I don't know about media council, um, but you know, talk to us about that. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mo, uh, Mo, Mr. Moura. When you began, sorry, you did mention that uh, my uh, profession, uh, players within my profession, that the accountants, the procurement of officers were asked by the president to start, step aside. I, I guess uh, it would add value for me just to give a vo uh, lend a voice to that. Um, as, as an institute, we are 100% behind the process to clean the professions. And we support the President's directive 100%. However, um, we are asking the process to be as objective as possible so that it serves the purpose for which it was intended. Point number two, as professionals, each one of us is subscribes to a set of ethical values and that is what defines a profession and, and I guess integrity is at the center of each and every profession it forms the base of the ethical standards of each and every profession so I guess with that in mind that is what defines a profession and then you then sit back and ask yourself what then makes us lose it because in each and everything, in each and every facet of public service or private service, you'd find professionals behind it. You mm -hmm. ask yourself, what is the issue? Point number one, I think as a people, holistically as a nation, we have lost our, our moral fabric is far too worn. And, and our solutions will not lie in, in because the professionals know mm -hmm. the, their convictions, their requirement to subscribe to these professional values. Mm -hmm. Then how do we then deal with the softer issues around ethics, mm -hmm. around integrity? How do we sing it? And, and somebody was cracking a joke, and I, I felt really bad, a Zambian. And then the fellow said, oh, you guys are screaming about $10 million being lost. Uh, in Kenya, they lose sums running into billions and nobody <laughs> cries. Uh, so life goes as, on. As life goes on. Mm -hmm. As professionals, as a people, we need just to really reevaluate ourselves. Now, the role of professionals then sits in how do we, as ISPAC a regulator, how do we crack the whip as and when it is necessary mm -hmm. without being prodded into doing it? First, Maura, uh, within the public sector, we must understand, we must really understand the placement of professionals and more so the accountants in the decision making um, mm -hmm. hierarchy mm -hmm. that uh, to, to the extent that corruption is perpetrated. Please, please enlighten us. What, what is the, where are they in the hierarchy? First, let's demystify this term accountant. Government is the greatest abuser of professionalism because the people that they hire, I would put the figure at 50% of them not being professionals because as a professional you must subscribe to some form of what? Ethical values and standards. So 50% of the people who sit in government and position or project themselves as accountants are not accountants. They are not regulated. You cannot crack the whip on them. So as and when you see NYS things going wrong, of the people who are there, yes, they bore the title accountants, but the majority of them, ISPAC has not regulated them. You have proof. You we do have checked proof. their names in your Absolutely. record and... And, and we, we, we're not stopping and saying that this guy is an accountant and we're doing nothing. We've lobbied with government to ensure how do we professionalize public mm. service so that as and when something happens, you hit them from that end, we hit them from this end, we blacklist them across the economy, we publish their names, they bear this red tag on their mm. necks mm -hmm. that I am corrupt, nobody employs them. Then what happens? we find a way of dealing with corruption at that point in time. Mm. But for as much as we do not lock professions, it would be hard for us to crack things. Is this fact doing everything in its power to ensure that the accountants they sort of approve or register are doing the right thing? We are doing the much that is possible within is that the everything? powers that we enjoy. The match is not everything. The match <laughs> is not everything. Because for one, yes. the law is limited. 
the Accountants Act is limiting. Okay. And we've pushed, we've pushed to a great extent to ensure that the um, perpetration acts of omission or commission that bring about corruption are punished well. But what sits in the law is, I would, uh, it, I would say it's a, an enticement to be corrupt because I will <laughs> engage in an act, make two million shillings, then you tell me, oh, for that, the fine is 50,000. Isn't mm -hmm. that so in a sense life? you feel the law sometimes works against you? The law is not okay. enough for us to crack the law. Hang on there. We'll come back and carry on with that. Rachel, let me come to you. Let's talk about solutions. Yes. KEPSA, uh, together with several institutions, including hers, are working on a business ethics course yes. that you developed together with the International Private Enterprise. In a nutshell, tell us about that course. So what we've looked at is to say what is our response to the environment that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. And what we are looking at is how we can work with individual companies, members of KEPSA, to be able to first of all, understand the environment, understand the issues that face their businesses, but also look inward and look at how they can create systems, checks and balances within their systems so that they are not caught out. Partly is also because of the work that KEPSA has done. We all know that the Anti-Bribery Act was passed mm -hmm. and KEPSA was really part forefront of pushing for that act. And we recognize that what that would do is that it puts responsibility on individuals and companies to then have a role in the, un the anti-bribery movement. What we are doing is being able to train individual members. It's a voluntary training for now. And what we are working on is how can we empower businesses to then have the system so that if maybe you've delayed with your payments, is when you're then at risk that a public um, official is likely to come and approach you and say, I know you haven't paid or you have failed to do this and that, or you've not registered for this, now if you give me something small, I'll be able to ensure that you, you go through as a business. So to be able to look at their systems, both business systems, but also systems in place to deal with ethical issues that may arise, so that they can strengthen themselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us in terms of time frames, what's happening so far, where are we in this particular process? So we've, what do you we've actually rolled out the training. We rolled out the first one. And what we're looking at is having as many of our members be able to first of all have that training. But beyond that, we're looking at also providing guidelines. Part of the work that we want to do is to also do standardized guidelines so that whether you're a big multinational, whether you're a mid-sized company, or even a small SME that just wants to build its systems at the earlier mm -hmm. stage, you will have a simple guideline that you can take and be able to put into your business processes and to use to be able to have uh, the resilience that we want businesses to have. And part of that is also recognizing that under the Anti-Bribery Act, we also have a role that the EACC, the Anti-Corruption Commission, plays, which is to work with us to be able to continue to strengthen the capacity of businesses. And so we've already started to engage with them. And we can say that we found a very open door. We have found they're very willing to work with us. They're also giving us their feedback and their input into the training course okay. so that we can work on this together. Okay. Yeah. And, and of course, for you watching us, uh, you can engage us in this uh, discussion. 2243 is our SMS line. Use the hashtag CitizenXT. Let us know your thoughts. Uh, private sector corruption. We've really focused on the uh, public sector for the last two, three months, but somebody must be supplying the goods, somebody must be helping and assisting in all this, and they come from the private sector. What are your thoughts? Let us know, and, and, and I'll read them even as we carry on with the program. Fatma, let me come back to you. You can add to what she said, because mm -hmm. I know this is an initiative that you're involved in. But also, tell me from an honest perspective, do people listen? You know, I get the feeling that everybody here attends some sort of religious institution every weekend. The, the sermons on corruption are so many. Do good, be good. But if you look at what's happening out there, it, it, it's completely different. So, so you are doing everything you can to teach people. Are they listening? How do you know they're listening? How do you know they're going to follow what you're doing? So, so answer that even as you, talk, as you add on to what Rachel had Actually, to Actually, at the moment, it's a hard sell. Let's be very honest. Okay. It's a hard sell. It's not very easy because all organizations will tell you, we are not corrupt. <laughs> the CEO will tell you, I'm not corrupt, so why should I attend the training? And what we tell them is that, fine, you may not be corrupt, and I have no reason not to believe you. But how sure are you, you are not corrupt, can you say the same for yourself? Mm -hmm. How sure? Mm -hmm. okay. And also because we have seen that, how do, how do organizations lose? Number one, you lose from direct corrupt practices, that is, giving out the money, but you also lose by about... Um, Almost 12% organizations lose because the cost of doing business is higher. How does it become? I need to come and buy something from you. When I go, you will tell me, okay, Mama, this will cost you uh, 20 shillings, but you must give me 25 
because ata yangu pia iko hapo mm -hmm. so what it basically means is that the client has to pay more in order to facilitate both payments so cost of business goes higher and this is when our organizations lose out because if i find you expensive then i will go to somebody else the issue here is it took two to tango we created this problem we now need to work together in order to remove this problem as rachel rightfully said we train number one and for me we just it's like hitting a stone it will not crack in a day <laughs> you have to hit and hit and hit some more until one day it will crack okay so we start by awareness we start by training but that's not where we stop after we have finished um, in the last training, by the way, we had ESCC, and it was a wonderful training. We had an open discussion and said, hey, guys, what are you people doing? But at the end of the day, no matter how much the government does, we also need to be part of the solution, mm -hmm. not just the problem. So we train. After we have trained, we literally hold your hand. How do we hold your hand? We want to make sure that you are able to comply with the laws. You are able to have um, due diligence. You are able to put the necessary measures so that even when your employee comes in, it doesn't matter whether you're a big company or you're an SME. You want to tell your people, you know, sometimes some conversations we don't have. You want to tell them, we do not condone this. Whether they do it or they don't do it, but you as an organization told them and they signed that I shall, you know, like the Ten Commandments, I shall not do this. At the Thou cost of a profit. Precisely. Actually, At it the cost of a profit. Not now really. Not really. Where go Let me tell you, research has shown that organizations that work ethically end up having more profits. They are more long term. You know, in Kenya, we want to make money, but when you die, what happens? If you have started a company today, you want that company to be sustainable and to outlive you mm -hmm. so that it can be there. But if you want to take shortcuts and make money now, it won't outlive you. then immediately you go, the company also. We will. have heard of cases, and I have friends who are doing business, mm. private sector. When you approach the procurement officer of a particular company, the moment they give you the job, they tell you, remember me yes. mm. when you get paid. It's that. So, so how are you going to make profit? If everyone is telling you remember me, and when you don't remember them, they don't give you work again. So I'm trying you to see, understand how that correlates with the company, research. That you've as a company, how do you make money? I make money, I make profits by increasing my revenue. That means I do more. Okay. I also make money by reducing my cost of doing business. I also make money by, by making my internal systems to be efficient and also to have what we call a niche. Look at us, for example. We are not a big organization. I could have been big if I wanted to say, okay, minta chukua milioni moja na yako nusu, something like mm -hmm. that. That, that. That's that. But you see, you, you as a founder or you as a CEO have to first make a decision. Which road do I want to take? Do I want to grow one level at a time? Lakini I nasimama kidete? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I grow again because at some point along your business line, people will know this company is not big, but this company delivers. It's not big, but it delivers. But it okay, delivers. and okay. that is how you grow, okay. and you make money, and you make money. Yeah. And I know you've, you've had a chance to work for companies you know, outside the country, and I'll oh, come yeah. back to you and, and, and get understand from your sort of practices mm -hmm. you've seen there that you think would work here as well. Fred, you can respond to what she had to say, even as you tell us, you said that as a government asks procurement officers and accountants to step aside the process must be objective please tell us what in your view objective means so you can say that after you respond to what um, she had to say uh, no, no, not really responding I just want to amplify the okay that she's talking about. When, when you talk about cost of corruption uh, I think as uh, Kenyans a time has come where we have to bring those costs closer to us at individual level I was sitting in a meeting somewhere where uh, Amzungu just asked me how does corruption impact on your uh, disposable income mm -hmm. and for some time i was lost but apparently it does why cost of corruption has a bearing on what i take home at the end of it all mm -hmm. because out of corruption medical supplies that ought to have gone into a hospital don't get there mm -hmm. so when people in my village fall sick then i'm called upon to chip in and fund that directly hitting me. If cost of corruption ensures, uh, corruption ensures that the roads are not well. So when I'm driving to work, I hit a pothole, I have to change my tires, directly mm. hitting me. So as, as Kenyans, on top of gratifying corruption, as we've done, because we have in churches,
a corrupt fellow comes, somebody we know that is very corrupt, comes and gives two million shillings and con contributions, the next thing is at the pulpit addressing mm -hmm. the congregation. What happens to the young people? They, we have positioned these guys as the role models the wrong way. Mm. So I guess beyond that, we need as a people now to come up and speak loudly about corruption because it's hurting us directly. Mm. Not knowing because, uh, like I've, I've explained, a lot of progress that would have, um, we would, would have attained as at our individual levels would be wiped out because of corruption. Now. Uh, and I go back to the question, the question that you asked about objectivity of the process. What are we essentially saying? Our constitution provides for rules of natural justice. Mm -hmm. So the process ought to be, uh, ought to, ought to uh, secure uh, some form of objectivity in the sense of, yes, you accuse me, because being told to step aside is an accusation. Can I be given the space to respond? Can I be given the mm -hmm. time? to adduce the evidence that I'm not as corrupt. Point number two, we need to appreciate. Let's, let's, let's look at the value chain now and you're doing the processing. Mm -hmm. uh, much, of, much of corruption is not at the point of pain. Corruption is actually uh, conceived during, uh, at the point of planning and budgeting and procuring. You cannot Seal so what, what would have been done. Scapegoats or uh, the low-hanging fruit <laughs> in the fight against God. Absolutely, because <laughs> as an accountant, when uh, a payment comes to me, uh, yes, the professional skepticism that I'm told to approach issues with, mm -hmm. then one of the things that I would do is the process followed. Mm -hmm. So if it was a tender and I see there is the tender advertisement, the tender evaluation committee are sat and evaluated. There are minutes. The awards are very clear. There is a professional opinion rendered by the professional, um, the head of prof professional unit. Mm -hmm. There is the award. There is the inspection and acceptance committee w that accepted the goods and they documented that they, they met the quality. And within that committee sits the user. Then there is the invoice that ties into what? The orders that we gave. Then, of course, uh, there is the budget that was provided. Who am I? I come at the very <laughs> tail end. But uh, what I'm saying, not as a, I'm, I'm kind of removing <laughs> the accountants, but I'm asking them with some level of professional skepticism. As and when an invoice comes before you, please let your third sense or your sixth sense talk to you. Mm. Just a quick Does question it. for you before I come to Rachel and before I read some of our feedback. Are your members ready to lose their jobs for saying no to deals that they feel are not upright? Um, that is a very hard question. I would answer that for me. discussion you've had, for example, because I know maybe that's the fear. Mm -hmm. I say I would, no. I would answer for me. I'm an accountant. I am ready to lose my job in an instance where I'm con uh, convinced saying no is the right thing. And I know there are a million, there are many accountants outside there who are willing and ready to say no. I will give the classical example, the Ministry of Health saga. That was an accountant. He came out and said, you guys, things are not right here. And obviously you're punished for that. You suffer, you're punished. You suffer and, and one way or the other. Unfortunately, you okay. suffer for that. Okay. But as an institute, there are interventions we're putting in place uh, to ensure that as and when an accountant stands for professionalism and is victimized, then there are steps to ensure that, yes, um, we help him. You can protect them or Absolutely. something of the sort. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have some feedback, um, an SMS and a tweet, I believe. We can put them up now. All right, uh, here's the first one. I believe, okay, so we have a text from Jack. You say that you're very touched when you see that everyone is trying to cut this menace of corruption. My question is, why don't we have a newly appointed group to be trained on the fight on corruption? Because we are heading nowhere. If we continue on like that, I am ready if I am picked. Okay, Jack, I hope you will do it for free uh, because that's really how you show us that you're really ready as a <laughs> in a voluntary position. Okay, let's look at that. We have a tweet now. Let's, put, let's have that up. Okay, coming up, and this is at who? Let's see here, at Kagoras. Citizens have become naturally corrupt. I have declined job offers twice for people asking for just 5,000 Kenyan shillings. I would rather be jobless. 
My goodness. Okay. Well, well done. Rachel, let me come to you. Um, mm -hmm. Let me read you a global survey in 2018 by Ernest and Young, and part of it was done in Kenya, showed a couple of things about corruption or fraud in the private sector. Some of the findings, the survey pointed a finger at senior management mm -hmm. who are seen to either turn a blind eye or actively engage in most fraud and corruption practices. Mm -hmm. The study also showed that 77% of those in senior positions sampled in the study said they were willing to justify some form of unethical behavior to help a business survive with one in three willing to offer cash payments to win or to retain business. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm wondering whether <laughs> what your training is going to achieve. <laughs> and this, okay, and it's a, unfortunately, it's yeah. a global survey. It's a yeah. global it's survey. A global and survey. A Europe, Asia, yeah. wherever you go to. And it's a serious indictment on the private sector, but also on the role of leaders. And if we think about it, we are really, we make a lot of noise at our political leaders and we say they're corrupt, they're mm -hmm. this or that. <laughs> but these are these are private sector leaders. These are people who will never appear on TV, who will, you know, they're behind the scenes. But it's to say this, that as we continue to use different tools in the struggle against corruption, we will make it so that it's painful for those in higher management mm. to make those types of decisions. If you think about the recent uh, news that we've been reading about companies being blacklisted or, dis or uh, barred from doing business with the World Bank, we've seen that it has come all the way to companies that are, that are doing business in Kenya. And you see that even if when at the point of drawing up the deal and determining what investment they were going to make, they set aside a consideration and say we will grease hands in order to be able mm -hmm. to get this business. There's almost a low budget a number for facilitation. Of years, if in the process of that same deal, they are able to then be hit back on by the system, mm. they are able to get punished, and they are able to see that there's actually no profit to be made from us trying to go around the system. And we've seen companies also being challenged for not even just bribery, things like fake documents where you don't have the manufacturer's authorization mm -hmm. but then you proceed to forge one and you are able to just to ensure that your bundle of documents appears to be proper and to be able to so those decisions are made at that level to say we have applied for this authorization letter we haven't received it but this is how we're going to go around the system so to be able to then show you know, business leaders that this is the heart that your company is going to this is where it hurts the most because you are doing this for the sake of money, profits, mm. increased income, and you're going to actually have diminished income and less access to even more contracts that you could have bid for because of these decisions that you're making. And I think as we continue, it's, continu it's ensuring that we have enough activities that will move the moving the needle. So we look at the issue of information, we look at strengthening companies, but then we also look at individual individuals themselves being held responsible for their actions but finally we'll be able to see a situation where companies are in a situation where they're so afraid but also we've created a platform where they're able to early to report and where mid, uh, you know uh, the governance body will be able to say we think that there's something suspicious in our procurement office we hear there has been a, you know there has been a notice a whistleblower says that there was a report made that they were asked for a bribe mm -hmm. and we will handle it and so by the time it comes up to them, because of the fear of the loss of future income, they will deal with it and that procurement person will be dealt with and so that we are also able to do the cleanup from different perspectives. Do we need a sort of private sector whistleblower company where if you feel that you're not getting help from your own society? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you some examples. First of all, someone is saying here, where can I report corruption and frustration in a particular office? They've named it, but I wouldn't say that on air mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the people from that particular office are not here to respond to that. And I did once receive an SMS on a show just like this one from someone who says that they used to work in a bank and they used to see a lot of underhanded sort of things happening and they had no idea who to report to. And I guess that's the cry of many Kenyans. They are watching shows like this and thinking, we also want to play our part. Mm -hmm. We are seeing things happening. We are not benefiting and we, you know, we want to do something about it, but where do we go to? So as you give, each of you give me your final thoughts on this, maybe that's something we can also talk a little bit about. How do we speak out as individuals, as citizens in the private sector? And Fahmna, let me start with you. Okay. You can report because you can report to the ESCC. It's anonymous. Um, as I said, they were part of the, of, of the training that okay. we did la last month. Um, and they said that Kenyans, we report we like talking but we don't document so we need to go on the platform on the CESCC platform and do it and then the other thing so if I see some forms in my office I secretly go somewhere and photocopy them <laughs> and then <laughs> and hand and them over and to and the ears it's anonymous yes, okay. and, and you go there but I think the, big, the, the, the bigger issue here is also you, you know, it starts with you honestly do not just point fingers we know there's a problem we know we've lost business I mean as, as, as an organization I've lost business um, the banks are there um, a, a bank that I will also not name 
we went and we wanted to train and we gave everything and it took me two years to get the contract and then when eventually I was given my financial proposal somebody casually told me um, I hope you've taken care of me and I'm like oh my goodness how <laughs> and, and, and it's that and then what really hit me is that when they said why are you surprised which which part of the country are you coming from I mean for you it's business even for people who need loans must give a certain percentage for their loan application to be processed it's not bad and it's your own money so it has to start with you you have to say this is what I am going to do remember the three things that we said you could do the quality um, you could reduce your cost in order to increase your revenue we all run into the increasing revenue without looking at our cost and without looking at our own niche and competitive advantage in 30 seconds what did you learn about how to fight corruption you know with some of the companies you worked with overseas uh, international companies actually don't even ask for anything what they look at is the quality and this is how we've been able to grow quality deliver on what you're supposed to okay and you can charge your premium price and you can charge your premium price Fred mm -hmm. what are your thoughts yeah uh, for for somebody to whistle blow, uh, the first thing that as a country must prioritize is the framework governing the whistle blowing. As we are, it's still in draft form. It has been in draft form for so long. So my plea to the policy makers mm -hmm. is: Can we get this whistle blower protection bill enacted mm -hmm. so that as and when I see something wrong, I'm assured that once I do it because corruption fights back and it fights back viciously Hard. so then <laughs> uh, there is there is a um, I, I'm assured of some soft landing so that for me is the first step before we push Kenyans into but at organizational level mm -hmm. uh, we also need to we need to need to implore our organizational private sector uh, to establish some form of internal whistleblowing mm -hmm. policy frameworks just to help manage it at that level because corruption as we've agreed through this discussion is not just outside there at the micro level at the institutional level there is corruption that is perpetrated even within the private sector itself leaving out the public sector uh, so at that level as well let's find organization developing mechanism by which people can whistle blow and they are no in, in an environment free of victimization okay Rachel, you can uh, wrap this up for us. And really is to say that for us as the private sector alliance, we are looking at how we can strengthen our members to have those systems that is just described. And we also face the same challenge. If you think about businesses in Kenya, we know there's registered ones that are paying their taxes that have been in business for many years. But many times when you hear about these corruption scandals, there'll be companies that were, in, uh, were registered a week before. Mm. So for us, it's trying to say, how can we build corporate culture and strengthen it in such a way that we shall, be, we shall have a group of companies that you will choose over and above these ones that have a registration of last week? How will you be able to then say, <laughs> because you'll say, I'd rather go with these ones who are straight, I can see their processes, and if they refuse to pay, they also are likely to the, still be able to provide me with the service that I need and to provide it in a quality manner. So for us, we, are not, we believe that uh, this is it's not hopeless. First of all, it's important to state that it's not hopeless. There is movement, there is traction. It might appear slow, and sometimes it looks like we're making two steps forward but two or uh, three steps back. Mm -hmm. But I think we're still making progress in the right direction. And the more that we talk, days like this are important because it allows us to have these types of conversations mm -hmm. and for people to know what resources are available to them to support them. The more that we talk, the more we look at solutions, the more we'll be able to actually achieve this fight. Fair. Against corruption. Fair enough. Thanks so much, Rachel, for that. So, is it in order to wish anyone Af happy African Anti Corruption <laughs> Day? Or yes, it's a, it, it should is. be a day of reflection. Mm. 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 At some point, when you were developing the Constitution of Kenya 2010, we asked ourselves, why are we even sitting Ethics and Anti Corruption Commission mm. in our Constitution? Mm. And the thinking was, have we, have we envisioned that as Kenyans will be perpetually corrupt? My goodness. Point number two, we've seen the leadership of the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission moving from one profession to the next. Mm -hmm. we, are finally have, we finally have a reverend sitting there. What if he fails? So you're essentially saying as men we've tried, man of God has failed, so that it becomes our way of life? <laughs> no. <laughs> let's, people of Kenya, let's face this in my small way possible. I'm as guilty as uh, the big guy. A 200 shilling bribe to the policeman is mm. as bad as uh, mm. 500,000 billion, billion, billion shillings. Billion. It's as bad. It's an evil. Let's tear to it. Let's speak against it. Let's act against it. If it takes going to the police station to pay the fine, so be it. Let's not corrupt our systems. Mm. This society is ours 
and for the chil our children and grandchildren if we don't take action today. And I implore the president, let's not just send the small accountants for vetting. Let the thing run all through. And if I were him, I would actually offer myself as the first officer to be vetted. Okay. And the surest way, the surest way is wealth declaration. In Kenya, we declare it and it is treated as what? A private affair. If you're declaring, declaration put it on, put it is on a, a website. Mm -hmm. Put it on a website that we can all access. Yes. Then that would for me be a good entry point into fighting corruption at that level. The Tone at the top very crucial to gaining traction around this fight. I know this is a topic we can go on for the next one hour, so I have to stop it there. <laughs> Let me read two quick SMSs as we take a break. Uh, Mutuko from Makwani County says, if we don't have a cure, and I don't see the correlation here, if we don't have a cure for cancer, it's not easy to cure corruption, okay? Uh, this is in tandem with the underworld. The big query is who are the members who participate in corruption, I guess. I, then, according to this discussion, it's you and I. Mm -hmm. While Eric Omoeng on Twitter says, Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Eric. Great topic. You see, there's so much corruption that we are forced to join them because we cannot beat them. Many Kenyans do not want to be corrupt because no one has our backs when we choose not to be corrupt. We fear we will suffer. Look at how many Kenyans are oppressed by corruption, but tell them, Hey, let's join hands. Let's go make our voices heard, for instance. Demonstrate no one will. Uh, no one wants to lose their jobs. You'd rather not be corrupt but turn a blind eye. Okay, so this is an interesting point he says. You'd rather not be corrupt but you also turn a blind eye to people who are being corrupt so that you live in peace. Okay, my goodness. Thank you for that, Eric. And thank you to everyone who participated. Fatma, Fred, and uh, Rachel, thank you for joining me in this conversation. And this is one we will continue to have. And we certainly hope that African nations will take African Anti-Corruption Day more seriously. I'm not saying we need a public holiday, but I think this should be a conversation <laughs> that our continent as a whole needs to have. Yes. We take a short break. You're watching Citizen Extra. Stay with us. The program continues shortly. Tragedy to this little town! We have to leave.